Hello, and welcome back to Missouri Civil War. Today we return to state politics and the impacts that Union victory had upon the political landscape in Missouri. Weeks ago, I suggested that when the Civil War began, most Missourians were pragmatic moderates who hoped to preserve the Union along with the Constitution as it existed. Yet as the war dragged on, Missourians' loyalties shifted. The state broke apart in many important ways. We see this in the first year of the war when the Camp Jackson riot and the presence of federal coercion led many people to identify with the South. Unionists were themselves divided between unconditional and conditional factions. Uh, the support of conditional unionists depended upon the national government protecting individual rights, including the rights of slaveholders. Today we see how emancipation changes uh, the political landscape. The Union's embrace of emancipation as a means to an end, military victory, alienates formerly loyal slaveholders. We see this tension as the moderates, who had been led by Hamilton Gamble, give way to a more radical faction of Republicans by 1864. Led by St. Louis attorney Charles Drake, these radicals were determined to consolidate the changes that the war has brought for much of Missouri. On September 1st, 1863, a new political organization emerged in Missouri, calling itself the Radical Union Party. Composed of unconditional unionists, these radicals supported bolder action on emancipation, far beyond the weak measure that the state had passed earlier that year. The radicals included a large number of Germans, whose anti-slavery views were well known, and merchants who looked upon the abolition of slavery as a needed first step for the state's modernization. Generally progressive in their vision for post-war Missouri, uh, these men style themselves in sharp contrast to the conservative leadership of Hamilton Gamble, who had stood squarely for the preservation of slavery. In their first real test in the fall of 1863, radical Union candidates narrowly lost a special judicial election. But in the Missouri General Assembly, radicals consolidated their power and managed to send one of their own, B. Gratz Brown of St. Louis, to the U.S. Senate. The following year began inauspiciously for the conservatives. Hamilton Gamble, the provisional governor, uh, suffered a fall and then contracted pneumonia. He died on January 31, 1864. His successor was Willard Hall, a former Democratic congressman from St. Joseph. Weeks later, radical leaders in the Missouri General Assembly called for an election of delegates to a convention that would consider a series of proposed amendments to the state constitution. These proposals included amending the existing 1820 constitution to address emancipation, to preserve the elective franchise of loyal citizens, and any other changes, quote, deemed essential to the public good, end quote. And so they believed there was a need to rewrite the state constitution. Radicals then dealt a greater blow to conservatives by seizing control of Republican Party machinery and putting their own candidate on the November ballot for statewide office. And as a result, the, the conservatives were left either to support the radical ticket or to jump to the Democrats. Nationally, Lincoln ran for re-election as the candidate of the National Union Party not the Republican Party. It was an effort to cultivate support of at least some war Democrats. To that end, Lincoln replaced his first vice president, Hamilton, Hannibal Hamlin, who was a New England Republican, with nominee Andrew Johnson, a Unionist Democrat and the wartime governor of Tennessee. Lincoln, we have to remember, entertained real doubts about his chances for re-election. On his left, he faced criticism from ardent abolitionists who thought that he had moved far too slowly against slavery. On his right, he was assailed for many reasons. He'd done far too much on emancipation. He had abused his executive power in suspending the writ of habeas corpus. And after all, the war seemed no closer to resolution. Blatant appeals to white voters' racism was a major part of the Democrats' 1864 campaign. Democrats were quick to condemn Lincoln and his black Republicans as the party of racial equality or even miscegenation. 
Before William Sherman's capture of Atlanta, Lincoln was privately convinced that he would in fact lose the election to Democrat George McClellan, former Union general with whom he had clashed early in the war. The election in Missouri came just days after Union troops had decisively beaten Sterling Price's invading Confederate forces, driven them from the state, as we learned last time. This 1864 race was a crucial election. It gave to Missouri voters their first chance to elect a full slate of state and local offices in years. Um, the Missouri radicals swept to victory. Their new governor was Thomas C. Fletcher, and his inauguration on January 2nd, 1865, marked an end to this long provisional government in Missouri. Radical candidates won almost three-fourths of the seats for this constitutional convention. Lincoln, for his part, won Missouri's electoral votes handily, with almost 70% of the vote. It's worth pointing out that some radicals in Missouri and nationally worried that Lincoln was too moderate. The president owed his margin of victory to the support of Union soldiers, as well as Missouri's loyalty oath. Remember, a great many Southern sympathizers who could not or would not swear this loyalty oath, they saw their voting rights stripped away. There were roughly 60,000 fewer votes cast than in the previous presidential election. One final point about this radical assent. By now, Missouri had gained two more seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, thanks to the tremendous population growth that had been measured back in the census of 1860. In that 1864 election, radical candidates took every congressional seat except one. In November 1864, after electing delegates to this convention, uh, there were 20 men chosen from St. Louis. Uh, they were vying for 10 seats. One of them who emerged victorious was Charles Drake. Uh, and Drake was a man who quickly became important and quite controversial at the convention. Uh, you might recall Drake making a previous appearance in this course when we talked about Dred Scott, as he had been one of the attorneys who prepared the Scott's case. In 1858, Charles Drake had been elected to the Missouri General Assembly. He alienated colleagues there with an arrogant, sometimes overbearing demeanor. He had been an unapologetic nativist, making attacks upon the dangers of alcohol uh, and making many enemies among Missouri's German-American population. The St. Louis attorney had also been a bitter critic of abolitionists. In time, Drake's opinions about slavery changed. And this mirrored a general shift among many Missouri Unionists. As a younger man, Drake had defended slaveholders, railing against abolitionists, but by 1861, uh, he became more critical of slavery. At first, he seemed to tolerate the preservation of slave labor, but not the cruelty of the institution itself. Drake eventually came to embrace gradual emancipation. He dismissed that, dismissed that 1863 Emancipation Law as bogus, and by 1864, he finally supported immediate and uncompensated emancipation. His conversion was so thorough that he asserted only traitors thought otherwise. Of the 66 men elected to the 1865 Constitutional Convention, only a small number had any experience with lawmaking. Just three of them had taken part in the 1861 convention that rejected secession. Most of the new delegates were small-town lawyers, merchants, farmers, or doctors. The greatest number of them were younger than 40. Only a fraction had been born in Missouri. A much larger proportion had come from the state of Ohio and other northern states. Drake's outspoken temperance views won him support of many of these rural citizens. At the convention, Drake quickly earned a reputation as a tireless worker, one whose prodigious efforts put him in the thick of seemingly every major question. To give you an example, the convention met for 78 days. By its end, many of the delegates had simply left town. Drake, however, missed only twice. He was not the convention's president. That distinction went to Arnold Kreckel of St. Charles. But Drake served as the vice president and a member of the crucial committees on legislation, revision, enrollment, and the elective franchise. He puts himself in the center of the action. 
In the convention's earliest days, delegates approved a new emancipation ordinance by an overwhelming majority. In January 1865, the raucous cheers to this, that accompanied this vote also brought about a swelling chorus of John Brown's body. It's a peculiar thing in Missouri to have this played on the heels of uh, that previous history that we've described. Of the 66 delegates, only four men voted against emancipation. Some of these opponents had sought provisions for the apprenticeship of young African Americans. Others wanted to expel all blacks from Missouri. Unlike the incrementalism of the previous emancipation law, this ordinance took effect immediately. Said the radical editor of the Missouri State Times, the day of Jubilee has come. It was clear that the convention's delegates agreed generally upon two things. First, the abolition of slavery, and second, the need to crush the rebellion. But beyond that, there was a wide difference of opinion. It was only after the state convention had been in session for 32 days that Drake formally moved that the Constitution be revised. In short order, he then argued that the delegates move further and draft an entirely new Constitution. This view reflected the radicals' abiding distrust of the Missouri General Assembly and their fear that Jefferson City someday would sabotage the radicals' wartime efforts. Radical unionists wanted to safeguard their program and a new state constitution. Said Charles Drake, we intend to erect a wall and a barrier in the shape of a constitution that shall be as high as the eternal heavens, deep down as the very center of the earth, so that they, conservatives, shall neither climb over it nor dig under it. Radicals chose to interpret Missourians' votes to hold this convention as a mandate for extensive change. The vote on whether to draft a new constitution was much closer than the emancipation uh, ballot had been. 27 voted in support, 19 voted in opposition, and 17 delegates were absent. There were two fundamental changes embodied in this new constitution that the radicals put forth. The first was the empowerment of African Americans in the state. The second was the punishment of disloyal Missourians. Questions involving African American rights beyond emancipation prompted sharp debate. This question of what freedom for former slaves would mean is one of the central points in our next lecture, and so I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Drake firmly supported freed slaves' equality before the law, but he was willing to push back the question of voting rights to a later date. Freedom, at the franchise, freedom and the franchise, at this point, were not inseparable. At the same time, radical delegates passed several measures to prevent Missouri Confederates from asserting their influence over post-war politics. At the center of this effort was the Test Oath, a measure that was modeled after a Maryland law, but was said to have been written entirely by Drake. Under Article II, for at least the next six years, a long list of Missourians would be required to swear a strict loyalty oath. Every voter and office holder and attorney and clergyman and teacher and juror had to swear that he had never been guilty of committing up to 86 disloyal acts. Any one of 86 would be sufficient to disqualify an individual. These acts included taking up arms in rebellion, giving aid, comfort, or support to anyone in such activity, contributing money, goods, letters, or information to the enemy, advising a person to enter enemy service, expressing sympathy for the enemy or any specific foe, fighting as a guerrilla or helping those who did. This list was so inclusive that even some loyal men could not take this so-called ironclad oath with a clear conscience. In addition, an ouster ordinance declared vacant more than 800 offices, judicial offices and civil offices across Missouri. With former rebels now disfranchised, these positions would be filled by good, loyal, and often radical men. And be sure that you grasp the breadth of this radical program and its vindictiveness. Southern sympathizers could not vote. 
They could not preach, teach, or practice law. And here we see the radicals' determination to win the contest for people's hearts and minds. Uh, they could not hold office. The power to hear and rule upon people's rights rested with local registration officials. In some places where officials were more lenient, Southern sympathizers might have their rights restored sooner. If the officials were more radical, their rights would not be restored anytime soon. What's happened for many Union leaders after years of war? Loyalty and radicalism had become synonymous. In other ways, the new Constitution was strikingly progressive. It created free public schools, although they were racially segregated. It also prohibited the state government from lending its credit to private individuals or corporations. In the years that, that follow, county governments uh, will become instrumental in wooing uh, the expansion of railroads. Delegates approved the new Constitution, including its ironclad oath, by a vote of 38 to 13. Several who voted to approve made clear that they would return home and fight strenuously to defeat its ratification. Some abolitionists were disappointed that Drake had not gone far enough to give equal political rights to African Americans. Other critics believed that the Constitution had exceeded its instructions and had gone too far in punishing even loyal men. Said one opponent, Moses Linton, may God and his good angels save us from this atrocious Constitution. In June 1865, the so-called Drake Constitution was submitted to the people of Missouri. A slim majority of Unionists ultimately approved it. The fractures within Missouri politics and society could not have been more pronounced. Conservatives would rail against the new Constitution as illegitimate, little more than a brazen power play by radicals. In time, successful court challenges would eliminate many of its harshest features, including the restrictions on voting and ministers and teachers. The divisions, though, that this Constitution reflected and deepened, those would endure. For next time, we consider the collapse of slavery and its implications for Missouri society. Until then.